like to go ahead and introduce today's speaker. Uh, Chuck Teliquin received his Bachelor of Science in Pharmacy at the University of Connecticut and his Doctor of Pharmacy degree from the Philadelphia College of Pharmacy and Science. He completed a hospital pharmacy residency at Duke University Medical Center where he also served on the clinical staff. Chuck completed a fellowship in infectious diseases and pharmacokinetics at the Clinical Pharmacokinetics Laboratory Millard Fillmore Hospital in Buffalo, New York. For 20 years, he was the director of the Infectious Disease Pharmacokinetics Laboratory, IDPL, at National Jewish Medical and Research Center, Denver, Colorado. Chuck now serves as professor of pharmacy and medicine at the University of Florida in Gainesville, where the IDPL is now located. Chuck and his lab are part of the U.S. Emerging Pathogens Institute. He also is a consultant to the FDA and the CDC. Chuck's laboratory serves as a national reference center for, determina for the determination of serum concentrations of the, for the antimicrobacterial, antifungal, and anti-HIV drugs, as well as linazolid. His research efforts focus on therapeutic drug monitoring and clinical trials for patients with advanced uh, mycobacterial diseases. Once again, it's my distinct privilege to uh, turn things over to uh, Chuck Pelican. Uh, why do TB drugs fail? Thank you, Mike. And we are broadcasting live from my office, which is pretty convenient. So you can all say that you've been to my office. On the first slide, we can see that uh, the development people here at the university have a fascination with folded arms and colored lights. Why, I don't know, but normally I have nice smiling photographs, but they wanted this very tough one for reasons that, uh, that are beyond me. But anyway, with that introduction, today we're going to talk about the following items. Some of my favorite pet slides will be shown for general principles. We'll talk a little bit about pharmacokinetics, some about pharmacodynamics, and then the centerpiece of the discussion will be on the RIFM license, their role in TB, and in patients who have TB plus HIV. As you all know, that's a very complicated type of situation, and we'll try to spend a little time on that. And then a few slides at the end just to discuss some ideas about therapeutic drug monitoring, and then we'll go through the question and answer period. Here's a slide showing some of our friends, and I think you all know, or many of you know these people individually. On the left, there's Denny Mitchison, who just celebrated his 90th birthday. He was very clear at the celebration that it was not a retirement party, it was a birthday party. In the center is Jacques Grosset. He's about to celebrate his 80th birthday. And on the right, Leonid Heifetz, who's the director of TV, uh, the TV laboratory at National Jewish in Denver and Leonid is now 83. So these are my heroes. These are the people who are going to fight to the bitter end against tuberculosis, and they're great role models. Why do TB drugs fail? Well, there's a lot of reasons, and many of these are familiar to you. If this was David Letterman, we could say the number one reason for patients to fail TB therapy is that they don't take their medications. And much has been written and discussed about directly observed therapy. That won't be the focus of today's discussion, but it still is the number one reason. Other reasons, and not in any particular order, they don't absorb their medications. And I think many of you are now familiar with that from firsthand experience. The medications can't reach the site of the infection, and that would include calcified lesions in the lung or because of the blood-brain barrier or any other barrier in the body that would keep a given drug from penetrating and thus reaching the organism and doing its job. Related to that, patients could have loculated lesions that would need either surgical drainage or debridement. It's very common with abscesses for other pathogens, but there are situations where surgical uh, treatment is needed for patients with tuberculosis. Patients are on the wrong doses of medications. Now, this could be a Homer Simpson, no, oh, somebody just makes a mistake in their prescribing. That's really not that common. Uh, more common is that there's a drug-drug interaction that changes the effective dose. So the milligram dose that you give the patient is not actually what their bloodstream sees as far as delivery of drug due to any number of interactions, and we will spend some time talking about that. They're on the wrong medications, and again, this could be because you don't have susceptibility data and you just have to make your best guess, and that guess could turn out to be wrong. Or, as we see in number seven, they have more than one strain of tuberculosis concurrently in their body, and while you might have susceptibility for one, you may or may not have susceptibility data for the other. And that is now increasingly appreciated as a possibility in patients, particularly in areas where there's a lot of transmission of tuberculosis. 
Number eight, their lesions are just too extensive, and their colony-forming count, colony-forming unit count is just too high for the drugs alone to take care of it. And that's directly related to number nine, especially in HIV-positive patients, but other patients who are immunocompromised for any number of reasons. They simply cannot clear those last persisters. They can't clear their last remaining organisms because their immune system just doesn't have the capacity to do so. We won't be able to talk about all of these different items today, but we'll focus on the ones that are my favorites, which would be the drugs themselves. So starting at the very beginning, Antibiotics 101, how do they work? For every drug with a proven mechanism of action, this action involves the drug entering the organism, binding to whatever target it's going after, and then producing either an inhibitory effect, which would be considered static, or a lethal effect, which would be considered cytal. Now, for every drug that we give, either orally or parenterally, the only way for that drug to reach where the organism is, is through the bloodstream. Therefore, if it ain't in the blood, it ain't in the bud. Pharmacokinetics matters. And this is something that doesn't get a lot of stress in the teaching of infectious diseases in general and in tuberculosis in particular. If the drug simply can't get to where it's going, can't find the bug, it's not going to have any activity. The pharmacokinetics that we are talking about today is really a fairly straightforward process. It's the study of the movement of a drug through a living system, and today we're talking about patients who have tuberculosis. How do we do this? Simple methods involve collecting plasma concentrations, so you'd get one or two blood samples at timed intervals after an observed dose, so you know when the dose was given, you know how much was given, and you know when the blood was collected. You can also collect other fluids, such as cerebral spinal fluid or pleural fluid or any other type of fluid which would be relevant to where the patient has the infectious process. And from this information, once you do the assay and measure the drug itself, that's when the fun part begins. Then you make an assessment of what that information is telling you. You want to get an estimate of the peak concentration, or otherwise known as Cmax. You want to, if you need to, for research purposes in particular, but you can also do it clinically, get a calculation of the area under the concentration versus time curve, or what people call AUC. And you can get the measures of other pharmacokinetic parameters, including volume, designated as V. And here, if we're giving oral drugs, then we have to take into account the bioavailability in that patient. And that bioavailability is designated by F. So you see F as the denominator V divided by F. Next to it, you see the clearance of the drug, which is typically through the liver and or the kidneys. And then the half-life, which is a hybrid of the first two. So volume and clearance are independent pharmacokinetic parameters from the purely kinetic standpoint in calculations, and from the two you can derive the half-life. And there are other ways of deriving the half-life. And that leads us to our question. How many of you feel comfortable on your own calculating a drug's half-life from serum concentration data? Well, the no's certainly have it so far. It's actually not as complicated as you might think, and even if you're not personally comfortable doing this, many pharmacists are very adept at doing this, and so you can contact the pharmacist that you work with, and they can go over it with you. You can do it graphically. You can do it on a handheld calculator. You can do it on an Excel spreadsheet. If you're really very uncomfortable with the concepts involving uh, pharmacokinetics. There's a nice book. I think it may be in the fourth edition at this point, uh, and I have no vested interest in the book, as uh, my disclaimer. It's from the American Society of Hospital Pharmacists, or Health Systems Pharmacists now, so ASHP.org. And the first author is Joseph DiPiro, D-I-P-I-R-O, and the title of the book is Concepts in clinical pharmacokinetics. And I really like this book because the chapters are short. They've got nice pictures. And I think it has maybe 14 fonts. So those of you who are visually challenged, and I just went and got my new glasses, 
then uh, this is a very useful textbook, and it goes through the basics of kinetics, and I would find it uh, to be very useful for just about any clinician. So what we want to think about today, and what we want to think about pretty much for any drug in any disease state, uh, is how do the patients, in this case with TB or HIV-associated TB, handle their drugs pharmacokinetically? Uh, do they have renal dysfunction? Do they have hepatic dysfunction? Do they have GI dysfunction? That's going to change the amount of drug that actually reaches the bloodstream and therefore is going to change the amount of drug that actually reaches the site of infection. A number of years ago, we completed a study with the ACTG, uh, and it was ACTG study number 309. The clinical pharmacokinetics of rifampin and ethambital in persons with tuberculosis. And David Perlman from New York was the first author on that. And the punchline from this study is shown on the following two slides. This is the rifampin slide. In the light blue, we have data from healthy volunteers. In the dark blue, we have data from TB patients who are extensively sampled. In the purple, or light purple, we have data from TB patients who only had two samples, in this case a two-hour and a six-hour sample, and then similarly sampled TB patients who also had HIV, and the latter patients are the ones who were in study 309. And you can see that these patients down here clearly have a change in the absorption pattern compared to the other healthy volunteers or patients with TB without HIV. If we go on to the next slide, we see a similar issue with Sambutol. An important thing to keep in mind with Sambutol is the minimal inhibitory concentration is typically either 1 or 2 micrograms per milliliter. So if, in fact, a patient's MIC for Sambutol is 2, and they happen to be in the group here with TB and HIV, you can see that the entire dosing interval has concentrations of ethambutol below the minimal inhibitory concentration, or MIC. Now, we don't have perfect data on how that translates to the efficacy of these drugs for TB, but in the vast majority of other infections, whether it be a Staph aureus infection or a Pseudomonas aeruginosa infection, you clearly would not purposely seek to treat patients with drugs for which the MIC is above the achievable concentrations in the blood. So by extension, it's a reasonable supposition that you don't want to do that with patients who have tuberculosis. Now, you might say, well, this doesn't confront me as long as I get my rent check by Friday. For you uh, George Thorogood fans out there, you'll recognize this from one bourbon, one scotch, one beer. Or, and there may be only two of you who would do this, but you might say that, well, what Chuck just showed is really not acceptable. We need to be thinking about the pharmacokinetics of these drugs and we'll talk more about that later in the presentation. Pharmacodynamics is really the endpoint that we're after. Pharmacokinetics is essentially the bridge between what's happening in the blood to how the drugs are actually working. So a simple definition of it is the combined use of knowledge of the drug's pharmacokinetics, which we can determine as a population in a study or in individual patients, and we combine that with knowledge of its antimicrobial activity. There are Lots of elegant studies have been done largely with gram-positive and gram-negative infections, some data with tuberculosis, and these typically involve either in vitro models, which tend to be the least expensive but do not include any immune system, animal models, which may or may not include an immune system. If you treat them with something to suppress their immune system, you can essentially make them neutropenic or otherwise immunocompromised. And then finally, human clinical trials with dose escalation, that's the definitive way to define the pharmacodynamics of the drugs. Unfortunately, most of the TB studies were not done with dose escalation, so we really don't know the spectrum of activity across a range of doses. We typically know, for example, the efficacy of rifampin at 600 milligrams and very little on either side of that. We have a little bit of data, but not nearly as much as we might like. For those who have heard presentations by me in the past, then you know that this is my favorite slide. And I always show it because it's my favorite slide. Also, it summarizes pharmacology on a single slide. 
And on the y-axis, we have probability. And that's an important concept to keep in mind throughout the presentation, and even more importantly in your practices. When we have drugs going into the body, we have an exposure based on drug concentration, which is on the x-axis. And we have two things that we're concerned about. Is the drug working, so the pharmacodynamic response or the positive effect, and for drugs that do show concentration-related toxicity, then there may be a curve that defines when that starts to become a clinically apparent problem. And in this example, as concentrations get above 30 micrograms per milliliter, this would begin to show perhaps what we might consider an unacceptable rate of toxicity with this hypothetical drug. But it's important to point out that even at low concentrations, the drug can still work. And keep in mind, we typically give as many as four drugs. In the case of MDRTB, more than four drugs. So even if the probability is low, there's still some probability that it'll work. And even at full absorption of the drug, there may not be 100% probability that it will work. What I've superimposed on this slide is this red line here. And what that refers to is the fact that in the pre-antibiotic era, approximately 25% of the patients would spontaneously cure. And I think some of the people that I showed on the slide at the beginning of the talk are among those who spontaneously cured from tuberculosis. And about 25% would be what people, at least at the time, called good chronics. The disease didn't kill them. They didn't kill the disease. They just went on and on. And of course, they could remain infectious for a very long period of time. And approximately 50% of the patients who could not be treated died from the tuberculosis. And the reason I bring this up is that when we do pharmacodynamic studies with tuberculosis, particularly in humans, we have to keep in mind that even if we do nothing, approximately 25% of the patients would get better eventually on their own. So that does complicate how we do pharmacodynamic calculations for these kinds of studies. Here I show a model that is taken from uh, Farsight companies win non lin software, which is a very common pharmacokinetic software package, and perhaps some of you have had a chance to use it in the past. And not to belabor the point here, but this is a very similar slide to what we just saw. Uh, we have effect on the y-axis, or response, if you will, and we have concentration on the x-axis. And in this particular model, we show with no drug, there's very little activity, and we're trying to inhibit here, we're trying to inhibit or kill organisms, so the curve is going down as opposed to the curve going up in the last slide. But you can orient them any way you want. But what it, the point of this slide is that you can see that it reaches a plateau, and that plateau is not at zero. So this would be some baseline response that the drug is not responsible for, and that addresses what I was just talking about, where some patients uh, would spontaneously cure, or if the drug has a sealing effect and it, it's not capable of killing all the organisms. So these kinds of models are very useful uh, with mouse model data and with human data to see if you can figure out what's the most important parameter which would instruct you on how to dose these drugs, whether you want to give big doses infrequently or have very continuous dosing, such as a continuous infusion, or at least daily or twice daily dosing. We'll talk a little bit more about that. In the literature for infectious diseases, when people talk about pharmacodynamics, they're usually talking about these three parameters. Now, these aren't the only things that could be described. They're simply the most commonly things that are described. And we refer back to the Cmax, or peak concentration, and we refer to the area under the curve, which I mentioned previously, and we refer to the minimal inhibitory concentration, or MIC. A limitation that we have in the treatment of tuberculosis is that rarely do we get a true MIC. Most laboratories report susceptible or resistant at some critical concentration. And that distinguishes between wild-type organisms that have not been exposed to antibiotics previously and those that have been previously exposed, and there's some level of selection of the resistant mutant population. So we'll look at these parameters and see how they might be applied to tuberculosis. This is a graph of a hypothetical drug. We have concentrations uh, on the x-axis and on the y-axis. Uh, we have, excuse me, we have concentrations on the y-axis and we have time on the x-axis. 
So we have a drug being absorbed on the upslope here, reaching a maximum concentration in this example of about 9, and then declining over time. And superimposed on this data from a human, we have a green line representing the minimal inhibitory concentration determined in the laboratory. Now, ideally, we would know what the MIC is in that patient while the bug is in that patient, but of course, we can't do that technologically. So we get a sputum sample, we have the laboratory isolate the organism, and test for the MIC. And in this case, we have the CMAX divided by the MIC, giving us a ratio of three, and that could be good or bad depending on how your drug works. And in this example, the time above the MIC during this dosing interval is about eight hours. So that's the time from here to over here. And after that, you have concentrations below the MIC. And at least as we think about the drug, minimal inhibitory concentration, or MIC, you would think that if you're below the minimal amount for inhibition, then you're not inhibiting the organism. Here's isoniazid, and it's thought to have the largest therapeutic margin, as the term has been coined. And you can see concentration on the y-axis, and we have time on the x-axis. And I've somewhat exaggerated the difference between slow acetylators and fast acetylators those who clear isoniazid very quickly. But you can see in both cases, because the MIC is so low, about 0.1 microgram per mil, the concentrations are orders of magnitude higher than that. So we're very likely, no matter what the key parameter is, whether it's time or peak or AUC, we're likely to be doing a good job with isoniazid. Then we'll turn to ethionamide. Ethionamide has overall fairly similar kinetics to isoniazid, and it has a similar mechanism of action. Not identical, but it's related. Both are prodrugs. Both get into the mycobacterium, are converted to some reactive intermediate, and that is what messes up the works for mycolic acid synthesis in MTB. But here you see that the MIC is one to two orders of magnitude higher than it is for isoniazid. So if these pictures were reversed, if this was the picture for ethionamide. Despite the fact that it causes a lot of nausea, ethionamide would be the first-line drug. But because this is the picture for ethionamide, it's a lousy drug. It barely gets a peak above the MIC, and it doesn't stay there for very long. So it's just a very, very weak drug, plus it makes you want to throw up. So it's not very popular. Now, there are a lot of terms that you might see in the literature, time-dependent antibiotics, such as a penicillin or a cephalosporin, or a concentration-dependent antibiotic, such as the aminoglycosides. And most of you are now familiar with once daily dosing of the aminoglycosides for gram-negative infections. Back when I was in training, and perhaps for some of you, everybody got gentamicin 80 milligrams every eight hours. We used to joke in the pharmacy holding up a vial of gentamicin. If God wanted the dose to be bigger, he would have put it in a bigger vial. Also, people are looking at quinolones given as large doses once daily, and you've seen some of that with levofloxacin for community-acquired or even ventilator-associated pneumonias, giving bigger doses to take advantage of this concentration-dependent killing. And then the rifamycin actually have the most profound concentration-dependent killing of all classes of antibiotics. It's just not well advertised. For these types of drugs, you generally want either a large peak divided by MIC, such as a ratio of 10 or 12 to 1, Cmax to MIC. You also probably want a high AUC to MIC, but that involves more discussion than we have time for today. So to give you some perspective on what this means, I'll use some historical examples. And one, now that I live in Florida, uh, I'll quote a Confederate general, Nathan Bedford Forrest, and his version of concentration dependent would be get the osmosis with the mostest. For those who paid attention to the Iraq War, and, and for you Wolf Blitzer fans out there, shock and awe was the buzzword some time ago about how the military was going to go up and clean up things in Iraq. But my favorite definition of all time for concentration dependence is from Arlie Ernie on the television program, Mail Call, open a can of whoop ass. Now, it turns out that rifampin actually is a can of whoop-ass, 
and you can get it at your local pharmacy. This is a slide uh, of mouse data in an acute infection model, a six-day model, done in India by J. Aram and colleagues. And what they showed is that as you escalate the dose given to these mice, different groups of mice, you get more and more killing of M. tuberculosis. And you'll notice, unlike the slides that I showed before that had a plateau, there's no plateau at the end of this. The doses, as they increase, just kill more and more organisms. So let's take a look at the previous example I was talking about, where you see a killing effect, but then it flattens out and no more killing can be achieved with higher and higher doses. That's not true with the data we have for tuberculosis. And these were over 800 milligrams per kilogram doses in the mice. Higher doses actually could not be tolerated by the mice. So we've never actually achieved the maximum effective dose of rifampin. Now over here, we see this is the equivalent of the current human dose. So we're at the minimally effective dose of rifampin, the way we currently dose our patients with 600 milligrams. You could argue that we should do something different than that. So, a dose response curve tells you exactly how well your patient will do with treatment, true or false. Drew is making a comeback here. All right, so the answer is false. As I was showing, the y-axis on those slides was a probability. So while it would be really, really convenient if it gave us an exact answer, it doesn't. It simply tells us the likelihood. It could be very likely that your patient is going to be cured. It could be very unlikely that your patient could be cured. But they're going to do what they're going to do. So, treatment of tuberculosis, and this is something you all know already. It involves six months of treatment or more. Concurrent illnesses are very common, including HIV, but not limited to that. So additional drugs are commonly given either for asthma or for hypertension or for other cardiovascular problems, so on and so forth. And therefore, we have to anticipate that we're going to have drug interactions. The most basic interaction is how do you give the drug? Can you give it with food? And somewhat less commonly nowadays, can you give it with antacids? And this is the study that we published in 1999. The point about that is that Rosanthin was on the market in 1972. So it's quite a long time to wait for this kind of data. And what we showed is that if you take it with a high-fat meal, which was a bacon and eggs breakfast, basically, then you're going to drop your peak concentration by about a third, but you're only going to drop your AOC by about 10%. Depending on the model, the Cmax is the most important parameter for rifampin. So based on the hollow fiber model data in vitro, you definitely do not want to be dropping your Cmax. Also, we know that AUC is the alternative as far as concentration-dependent killing, so even though 10% is a relatively modest change, I already stated that the 600 milligram dose is the minimum dose of rifampin, so minimum minus 10% means you're below the minimum effective dose. Moral of this story is that it's best that the patient takes the first-line TB drugs on an empty stomach if at all possible. If that's not possible, then I would recommend that they take the drugs with a really light snack like graham crackers or a cookie or something light and not a Big Mac or a pizza or something like that. The basic definition of a pharmacokinetic interaction is that the presence of one drug alters the pharmacokinetics of another drug. The most famous example is rifampin, and rifampin is perhaps the most potent enzyme inducer in the liver of all the drugs that we give. And most of the HIV protease inhibitors are cleared through cytochrome P453A4 or CYP3A4, and therefore, they're going to have profound interactions with rifampin. On the other side of the coin, ritonavir is a drug that decreases the clearance of drugs through CYP3A4, 
And, in fact, we use that to our advantage to block the clearance of other drugs such as lopinavir. So that is what we call boosting. Therefore, you can see a drug interaction could be good or bad depending on what's happening and what your goal is. Looking at the rifamycins as a class, at least the ones that are currently on the market, the first column we see the CYP3A4 induction, and rifampin we'll call that 1.0 or full induction. And rifapentine is really not a bargain at 0.85. So you can't use rifapentine to get around this problem because the problem is almost as big. But rifabutin has considerable less enzyme induction for CYP3A4, so you could use rifabutin with other drugs that are cleared by that enzyme and still not have a massive drug-drug interaction. And that's the basis of the guidelines that you use almost every day for TB and HIV. Some unique features of the drug, rifampin can cause this flu-like syndrome, but it's really seen with large intermittent doses that were studied three decades ago. So in those cases, 1,800 milligrams once a week, 1,200 milligrams twice a week, those are the situations, particularly after three months, where you're likely to run into the flu-like syndrome. It's really not such a problem with daily doses, especially down at the 600 milligram range. If your patient is malabsorbing the drug, you can escalate the dose of rifampin. You're still not going to get into the flu-like syndrome problem. Rifabutin, unlike the other two drugs, is also cleared by CYP3A4, at least partially, and its metabolite, the desacetyl rifabutin, is almost completely cleared by it. So this drug can accumulate with drug-drug interactions, including with ritonavir, and in particular with clarithromycin. And anterior uveitis, or neutropenia, can be seen as well as arthralgia. Rifapentine is an interesting drug in that it is very highly protein-bound, about 98%. And this is probably why the drug didn't look so good in the clinical trials that eventually brought it to the market. It had substantially higher failure rates, but that was at a dose of 600 milligrams once a week. And if a much higher dose had been used, say 1,200 milligrams or 1,800 milligrams, or if the drug had been given more frequently, then it probably would have been at least as effective as rifampin. People are now going back uh, to look at that, and including uh, the Public Health Service, the TBTC trial 29 is going to look at uh, daily doses of rifampin instead of once a week and hopefully it's going to be much, much more active. This is a guideline that was written by Bill Berman and reviewed by several people associated with the CDC, including myself. It's a very good guideline. It has lots of good information. And in the guideline, it lists what the limitations are. And the major limitation was that for some of the combinations we would like to know about, we either had no data or we had data only from healthy volunteers. And what is really true of drug interactions for the rifamycins and the HIV drugs, including the protease inhibitors, they look differently in healthy volunteers than they do in HIV-positive patients. So let's explore that a little bit. Here's a slide that shows the interaction of rifampin with the protease inhibitors, and the percent changes, and they're all going downward. Uh, are the drop in the area under the curve of the protease inhibitor. And with the exception of ritonavir, you really can't be giving rifampin with any of these drugs. Rifabutin, on the other hand, you may not want to give it with sequinavir, but with the other protease inhibitors, you probably could give it because there's not a profound change in the concentration of those other drugs. So we try to take advantage of this clinically. With rifampin, if you're going to think about using it in the context of a highly active antiretroviral therapy regimen, then you'll see that even with the 100 milligram dose of ritonavir, the rifampin interaction drops the AUC of lopinavir by 75%, which is too high. It, it's just not going to be a useful drug. One of the considerations would be to double the dose of Kaletra. You have 800 milligrams of lopinavir plus 200 of ritonavir twice a day. The problem with that is it's very toxic to your wallet. That's an additional $9,700, at least based on the list price shown at drugstore.com on your webpage. So if you were to look up these drugs, you'd say that they're kind of spendy, and doubling the dose means it's going to be extremely spendy. 
Another problem with this, which is falling short of a full endorsement for using it, is that in the healthy volunteer study, all of the patients showed hepatitis. And it probably won't be the case with HIV-positive patients, but at least in healthy volunteers, there was some issues with using a high-dose response to enzyme induction by rifampin. Now, an alternative might be to add ritonavir. So you could use a 400-milligram dose of ritonavir instead of a 100-milligram. And that would be a reasonable way to go from the pharmacokinetic standpoint, but I think those of you who have treated HIV-positive patients for a while and have used the older doses of 600 milligrams of ritonavir or combinations with high-dose ritonavir, you know that that's not the easiest drug to tolerate. So while this theoretically could work, and it certainly seems to work in uh, children, and I believe they were studied in South Africa by Helen McElleron and company, it's not necessarily the option of choice. So what people tend to do is they tend to look to rifibutin. And here's an example where you could use lopinavir, ritonavir, and you don't really have to change the dose of that drug, at least to begin with. And people have been using the lower dose of rifibutin. Instead of 300 milligrams daily, they've dropped it considerably all the way down to 150 milligrams every other day or three times a week. But this was based on healthy volunteer data. In the healthy volunteers, there was a tripling of the AUC for rifibutin, and the metabolite, which putatively is active, and we'll talk about that, went up almost 48-fold, a profound drug interaction there. But again, that's healthy volunteers. One of the original studies looking at this issue was done by my colleague, Keith Galicano, and they looked at 400 milligrams of ritonavir and 400 milligrams of sequinavir, and they looked at it in HIV-positive patients who did not have tuberculosis. And so the guideline that you just saw on the previous page essentially can be traced back to this study. So the good news, it was in healthy volunteers, uh, excuse me, it was not in healthy volunteers, it was in HIV-positive patients, but does that directly translate from a 400 milligram dose of ritonavir here to a 100 milligram dose of ritonavir here, and should we really be giving intermittent regimens to HIV-positive TB patients? So some of the early data came from U.S. Public Health Service TB trial study 23 and the pharmacokinetic sub-study sub 23A. Now, if you look at the parent study 23, the patients who were most likely to fail or relapse, and they did so with acquired rifamycin resistance, which is definitely different than what we previously saw, there was an association with low CD4 count. Then we looked at the pharmacokinetics to see if that might be one of the reasons for this. And indeed, in this particular study, which was given twice weekly, the dose of isoniazid was 900 milligrams given twice weekly, the low concentrations of isoniazid were associated with failure or relapse, both with acquired rifamycin resistance. So the group C is the data from the prior study, the rifapentine study, and these patients were all cured. And so this was the AUC that was seen for the cured patients who were HIV negative in study 22. Then the middle group in study 23A, these were the patients who were cured, but you could see that their AUCs are considerably lower than what was seen in the HIV negative patients. And then the patients who did the worst with acquired rifamycin resistance had the lowest AUCs of all. So the moral of the story is, if you don't have enough isoniazid, and in particular if you're giving it intermittently, you can run into failures or relapses with acquired rifamycin resistance. In this case, the AUC that we see for the group A is equivalent of giving 350 milligrams twice a week. Now, none of you, I believe, would spontaneously choose that dose, but if your patient malabsorbs it, effectively, that's what you're giving. Now, I showed you earlier that INH has the largest therapeutic margin, yet here the low concentrations were associated with failure or relapse in the selection of rifamycin resistance. So if isoniazid is, by that measure, the most potent of the TB drugs, then it seems reasonable to believe that if you malabsorb the other drugs, the less potent drugs, particularly the second-line drugs, that they're not going to work very well either. 
Continuing with study 23A, and this is a rifibutin data, 300 milligrams twice a week. So it's not exactly the same as the guideline I showed you for lopinavir, but there was no lopinavir in this particular study. Again, the low concentrations were associated with failure or relapse in acquired rifamycin resistance. And you can see there's almost a complete separation of the patients who did poorly pharmacokinetically from the bulk of the patients who did well. But you can see that down here, some patients with low concentrations did well despite that, and one patient with good absorption did well, unfortunately, did not do well, unfortunately, even with the good concentration. So what are we seeing here? We're seeing another version of this slide. So the solo patient who had acquired rifamycin resistance, yet good concentration is up here on the curve. He was likely to get a good response, but did not. And the patients who were cured but had low concentrations are down here on the curve. They were not expected to do well on a probability basis, yet they did. Now, when we looked at the data carefully, as I mentioned in the parent study, if you had a low CD4 count, you were much more likely to have acquired rifamycin resistance than if you had a higher CD4 count. But if you look at what happens if you control for the rifibutin concentration and CD4 count in the same analysis, that basically the CD4 count drops out. The odds ratio is 1.04. In other words, it's really not indicative of what's going to happen. The odds ratio for acquired rifamycin resistance with failure or relapse with low rifibutin concentration was 23, which is a huge odds ratio. So it's telling us that in the parent study, that low CD4 count was serving as a surrogate marker for rifibutin malabsorption. So I'll make the point here that in this study, 23, about 95% of the patients were effectively treated. So I'm not saying that rifibutin can't work, because it can but what I am saying is that when it doesn't work, instead of the traditional failure or relapse with drug-susceptible TB, we're seeing acquired rifamycin resistance, which is a much bigger problem that we have to deal with. And this has been seen in other studies. So this is the paper by Liz Jenny and colleagues out of New York, and this was published just this year, earlier this year, and they report three cases from their practices where they had intermittent Rifibutin dosing with a boosted protease inhibitor therapy, and they had three cases of acquired rifamycin resistance, basically recapitulating what was seen in study 23A. And in a paper that will be published in November this year in Clinical Infectious Diseases, our colleagues at AG Holly Hospital uh, did a nice study in 10 patients, and I'll present portion of the data here, 10 patients who had TB and HIV, and we measured rifibutin, its putatively active metabolite, and lopinavir concentration. In the first two sections of the study, people started on 300 milligrams of rifibutin three times a week, but when uh, the uh, lopinavir was added, that was dropped to 150 milligrams three times a week. And here are the concentration data that we got from the study. And the circles are on rifibutin without lopinavir ritonavir, and the triangles are on rifibutin with the lopinavir ritonavir combination. And what you see is that in most cases, the peak concentration or Cmax actually dropped after we dropped the dose of rifibutin but added the protease inhibitors, which theoretically, and we'll see some data actually change the concentrations of rifibutin. But you can see this is a red line here that represents the target Cmax that we derived from study 23A. So in study 23A, if you had a rifibutin T concentration of 0.45 or higher, you were much more likely to do well. And if you did not, you were much more likely to have acquired rifamycin resistance. And what we can see from this particular data is that most of the patients in our small study had concentrations below that target value. If we turn to the area under the curve for rifibutin, the target value from study 23 was having an AUC 5.2 or greater. And while we have a few of the patients with AUC that high, 
In most cases, they were below that target AUC. One of the patients in this pharmacokinetic study, again, this was not an efficacy study, this was just a PK study, yet one of the patients failed with acquired rifamycin resistance. So you might guess that it's subject number eight. The slides are oriented vertically. So this is subject eight, this is subject four over here, but it was actually subject 10. This was before the addition of the lopinavir. This is after the addition of lopinavir, but in both cases below the target value. So this patient failed with acquired rifamycin resistance. Now, I wouldn't go as far as to start quoting uh, percentages from such a small study. Uh, probably the better number to use would be from study 23A, in which case 5% of the patients went out to this state. In this study with only 10 subjects, and one of those 10 also had a failure with acquired rifamycin resistance. Now, if we turn our attention to the metabolite, I showed the healthy volunteer data where this goes up 48-fold in healthy volunteers. Clearly, we're not seeing that. We're seeing maybe a 4 to 8-fold range of increase. So this is before the ritonavir, lopinavir, and this is after for subject 2 and so forth. So the vast majority of patients had their uh, metabolite AUC go up, but nothing as dramatic as was seen in the healthy volunteers. Now, people in the literature and in discussion say, well, the metabolite is just as active as the parent compound, so the fact that we have less rifabutin but more metabolite, well, that should be a wash because it's equipotent, and it is published. But if you trace that back to the original publication, it was one isolate, the laboratory strain H37RV, studied in Italy in the 1980s and published in 1984. So the total world literature is one isolate of TB, where the rifabutin and its metabolite does the fetal rifabutin more equally potent. And we were able to show that again in uh, the laboratory tests that we did, but if you took clinical isolates, you did not see that. So on the left, we see the rifabutin minimal inhibitory concentration. So this is not um, proportion testing, this is actual MIC testing. And you can see that there is an eight-fold variability from less than or equal to 0 0.3, 0 0.03 micrograms per mil, up to 0.25. And you could say that that is marginally susceptible to rifabutin, even though the isolates were all considered rifampin susceptible. But let's look at the metabolite. And you can see that there's a big range for the metabolite as well, and some of them essentially were resistant to the metabolite. And the range was, on average, two-fold difference, but as much as a four-fold or greater difference between the MIC of the metabolite, which was higher than the MIC of the parent drug. So when we have this drug-drug interaction, we're not trading one for one. We're actually losing potency because the metabolite is just not as potent. So to conclude this section, many dosage recommendations that we have for rifabutin and, and HIV drugs are based only on healthy volunteer data, and we need the clinical data to take it further. The dosing recommendations are essentially assuming that every patient you treat is the median healthy volunteer because the recommendations say, well, everybody should get rifabutin 150 milligrams three times a week if you're giving Talitra. Well, we just showed that that's probably not the way to go. And then, unfortunately, in clinical practice, we don't get MIC data. We have susceptible or resistant, but we really don't know if there are patients who have more resistant organisms where we should push the doses or very, very susceptible organisms where a standard dose should be fine. So, a question for you all. When rifabutin is given with lopinavir and ritonavir, the metabolite does acetyl rifabutin increases less in the HIV positive patients than in healthy volunteers, and the metabolite is not as active as the parent drug. True or false? Well, it looks like everyone is passing their morning alertness test. So that is just what I told you, and you remembered it. And so hopefully tomorrow and the day after it, you'll also remember. So I'm going to show a series of slides to just look at the concentration versus time curves for the drugs we commonly use so we get a sense of what's really happening or what should be happening as the patients take these drugs. And what we want to look at is, 
is are there dosing combinations that are not favorable that might be leading to some of the problems I just showed you. So this is for Stampin, and in the blue we have the total drug, and then in the red we have the microbiologically active free or not protein bound portion of it. And then we have the MIC, which is around 0.2 micrograms per mil. So you can see that there's a pretty good punch from Rustampin. It's well above the MIC, and it stays above it for about 12 hours. Now, if we look at Rusabutin, and we look at the data derived from the study done at H.E. Holly that I just showed you, then if we look at 300 milligram dose even before the Kaletra was added, 100% of the dosing interval showed concentrations of free drug below the MIC. And for most diseases, you would not purposefully choose a dose that gives you concentrations below the MIC. Now, if we were to just double the dose, which I know nobody does, but if we were to give risibutin 600 milligrams, we still have a pretty wimpy-looking curve. Now, that doesn't mean that risibutin can't work, and it doesn't mean that, you know, risibutin is working in places other than the plasma, which is what we're looking at here. It almost certainly does. But the fact that there's not a lot of free drug in the plasma is a little bit disquieting. If we look at rifampentine, it's very highly protein bound, so very little of the drug is free. So I'll expand the y-axis, or shrink it actually, so that you can see that the MIC is about the same as rifampentine, at about 0.04 micrograms per mil. And in this case, we have concentrations above the MIC for 48 hours, whereas with rifampentine, we have them below the MIC. For 48 hours. So is this good? Is this bad? Is this neutral? So we'll compare all of them. We can see that uh, the free concentration of rifampin is the highest, but rifapentines last the longest above the MIC, and rifabutin unfortunately lasts a long time, but it's below the MIC, or minimal inhibitory concentration. If we start matching them with common drugs we use them with, we have INH, rifampin, and ethambutol on this slide. And INH and rifampin in particular are well matched, and they're both gone as far as the active portion of the drug between 12 hours, maybe 16 hours in the slow acetylator. The standitol, as I mentioned earlier, the MIC is either 1 or 2 micrograms per mil. So if we consider that, the standitol probably stops working or loses most of its punch by 8 hours after the dose. But it hangs around for a lot longer than that. Here's with rifabutin, very low rifabutin concentrations. And the problem is the rifabutin is still hanging around out here, but the INH is completely gone out here. So if we're doing this dosing every other day, rifabutin and a little bit of below MIC acetamitol is hanging around on that second day after the dosing. Here's rifapentine, a related problem. It's more or less by itself as far as an active drug for the second day, the odd day in our every other dosing scheme. So the moral of this story is that rifampin, INH, PZA, and esambitol are reasonably well matched pharmacokinetically, especially when they're given daily. Intermittent rifabutin regimen, including those same companion drugs, leave sub-MIC rifabutin concentrations as monotherapy about every other day or three days a week. With rifapentine, it's above the MIC, but it's essentially monotherapy every other day. So at least in HIV-positive patients who don't have much of an immune response to capture and eliminate the TB, we have to call up the question whether intermittent dosing is really what we want to do. And while there's probably multiple explanations why we are getting acquired rifamycin resistance, at least from a kinetic and dynamic standpoint, this seems to be consistent with the data that we're seeing. Here is a nice slide from the CDC, and I believe Ken Castro showed this when he gave this grand round earlier this year. And the point is not to exhaustively review MDR-TV and worse versions of XDR-TV. The point is to look at the last column on the right. Consider surgery, consider surgery, surgery is possible. So that is a polite way of saying this regimen stinks. So if you have a stinky regimen, and further, if it's not well matched pharmacokinetically, and further still, if patients malabsorb this stinky regimen, then we can't really expect it to work well. So I will give an example of a new experimental drug, hoping to be a drug. It doesn't have a drug name yet. 
This is TAA-24, which I'm sure many of you have heard about, at a 600 milligram dose, and it's pretty highly protein bound. So here is the free drug here, and here is the MIC. So this is kind of a hybrid between what we see with rifabutin and with rifapentine. It hangs around for a long time, about a day above the MIC and a day below the MIC, if you were to give uh, intermittent regimen with this. Companion drugs that we might use with it, ethionamide, as I mentioned earlier, barely gets above the MIC and quickly falls below it, so it's not a very good drug because the MIC is so high. Here's cyclosterine, which is actually not protein-bound, so there's just one line on this slide. The MIC is a little tricky to calculate, especially in liquid media, because of competition with dialanine in the liquid media. So let's just say the MIC is 8 micrograms per mil. So even though we get a pretty robust concentration of around 20 micrograms per mil, the MIC is 8. It stays above it only for maybe 12 hours or so. So you could make the argument that cyclosterine ought to be dosed every 12 hours. And there's not clinical data to prove that one way or the other, but that would be a suggestion from this data. So here's capriomycin, which is only modestly protein-bound, and the MIC is relatively low at maybe 2, maybe 4 micrograms per mil, depending on the isolate. So let's put these together, and we can, we can see a picture of kind of what we were seeing before. And here are the cyclosterine and capriomycin up here, and here's the ethionamide and PA down here. And you can see that these drugs are hanging around for a long time, but for caprio and for cyclosterine, probably at below the MIC for most of the dosing interval out here, if you're giving it every other day. But let's take a look, if we just look at the portion of the area versus concentration versus time curves, that is above the MIC. So here is ethionamide. Don't sneeze, you'll miss it, okay? And then here's TAA24, and here are the other two drugs. So you can see if this is one of the four pillars that you're, you're supported by, this is a pretty wobbly pillar, ethionamide here. And then finally, just to throw a monkey wrench into the works, here is TMC207. And for the entire dosing interval, the free drug concentration, because it's 99.9% .9 protein bound, are below the MIC. Now, the drug comes off the protein, that's obvious, and maybe most of what it's doing is not in the plasma space. So this is an interesting drug, and the story is perhaps reminiscent of a drug like azithromycin against MAC, where most of the drug is not in the plasma space, or digoxin, which we know works for heart failure and, and uh, arrhythmias, but most of the drug is not in the plasma. TMC is going to be one of those unusual drugs that has unusual kinetics, yet we know from the data so far that it does work. Finally, on therapeutic drug monitoring. TDM aims to promote optimum drug treatment by maintaining serum drug concentrations within a normal range or preferably a therapeutic range. And you have to use this in conjunction with other clinical data. And all together, it allows you to make an assessment of whether you need to intervene on your dosing with your patient. If you want to read more about it, and I do encourage you, there's a great paper by Roger Jelliff published in Therapeutic Drug Monitoring in 2000. And the point of this paper is that therapeutic concentrations vary by patient. You can have an otherwise healthy patient who's doing great, and you can have a critically ill patient in the ICU who's on the edge of death. And you might argue that the patient on the edge of death, you're going to have to pull out all the stops and just push the drugs hard to pull the patient back towards the living side of things. What Roger would suggest and I would suggest is that we don't want to just think in terms of doses. We want to think in terms of what concentration do we want in the plasma. Do I want to push hard? And how do I define pushing hard? And then once you decide how hard you're going to push, in other words, what concentration you want, then I would argue, and Roger would argue, that you should actually measure it and make sure you're doing that. And if you're not, change the dose to get to where you want to be. So to conclude, the design of new regimens and the guidelines for current regimens need to take into account this PKPD mismatch. And perhaps some of the things that I showed to you today are relevant as to why we're seeing acquired rifamycin resistance. Actual MICs, which are not commonly done now, would be highly desirable for assessing PKPD mismatch. Some current second-line drugs probably need 
multiple daily doses. Ethionamide, you could say, needs a continuous infusion, but there's no IV form of it. Cycloserin, you could argue, could be given twice a day. And this is problematic for a DOT program that's being done on an outpatient basis. Not so much a problem for an inpatient uh, situation, but clearly on an outpatient basis, that's a problem. Therapeutic drug monitoring can confirm whether or not the PKPD targets have been achieved in an individual patient. Drug concentrations provide just one measure of the adequacy of a regimen. Additional key components are the extent of the patient's disease and whether her immune system is working or not. But the latter two have only crude measures. We have x-rays, we have CAT scans, we have CD4 counts, we have viral loads, but it doesn't tell us, well, this patient has you know, 20,000 T cells that are specifically geared to deal with tuberculosis. We don't have that kind of information. Finally, TDA may allow you to shorten treatment or to avoid concentration-related toxicities for those drugs like ethanabitol that have concentration-related toxicity. And in particular, TDA really allows you to unravel complicated multidrug interactions. All the tables I mentioned in those uh, guidelines are very helpful but they're just two-way drug interactions. Once you get to three, four drug interactions, such as lopinavir, ritonavir, rifabutin, and fluconazole, not an impossible regimen to be on, there's no way to predict what's going to happen. There's too many drugs all pushing and pulling on the same end. So with that, I'll say go Gators, and I thank you for your attention. I'll turn this over to Mike. Uh, for an outstanding presentation uh, once again. Um, we'll go ahead and open the floor now uh, for questions. Uh, questions will be taken on a first-come uh, basis and will be answered given the time allotted. Uh, you may ask your questions either online or by phone. Uh, instructions for asking your questions online are on your screen. Uh, the operator now, I will, I will go ahead and turn over to the operator now to uh, go ahead and provide some instructions to ask your questions by phone. Uh, operator? Thank you, sir. Ladies and gentlemen, if you would like to register for a question, please press the 1 followed by the 4 on your telephone. You will hear a three-tone prompt to acknowledge your request. Your line will briefly be accessed from the conference to obtain information. If your question has already been answered and you would like to withdraw your registration, please press the 1 followed by the 3. If you are using a speakerphone, please lift your handset before entering your request. Once again, to register for a question, press 1 4 on your telephone now. One moment, please, for the first question. Well, um, I want to go ahead and start with uh, one that we received online uh, earlier, and I'm going to go ahead and uh, pass this on to, uh, to Chuck. Um, I'll go ahead and read it that we got on the uh, chat. Uh, a TB patient has drug serum concentration testing done, and one of the drugs, uh, for example, INH, has a very low concentration uh, based on this data, and it was referring back to some of the earlier slides. Uh, the dose has increased. Uh, repeat testing shows that the, con the new concentration is therapeutic. The question uh, posed was, uh, are the side effects of the drug related to the therapeutic dose or the normal dose? Well, when a drug is not being absorbed, you're basically giving the patient, depending on the cost of the drug, expensive stool. So the drug that is just going out in the gastrointestinal tract is going to have no impact on the toxicity unless you were giving a drug that is specifically toxic to the gastrointestinal tract. So in this case, with isoniazid, no, I would not think that it's going to have uh, any difference. What I tend to like to encourage people to do is not think in, the, in terms of the milligram dose, because that's merely a convenience for standardizing how much you put into the patient's mouth and then into their stomach. But it's what happens after that and how much actually gets into the bloodstream that is going to either have your... Uh, your therapeutic effect or your toxicity. Now, specifically to the question of are the side effects of this drug or other drugs related to the concentration, in the case of isoniazid, largely no. The main toxicity we're worried about is hepatotoxicity, and in the ATS statement that uh, we published a few years ago, for INH and rifampin, the hepatotoxicity is idiosyncratic. It's not related to concentration. Notice that we give 900 milligrams of, of isoniazid three times a week, but if it was related to the dose or the, the peak concentration per se, those patients would all be getting hepatotoxic, yet they are not. So um, at least in, in the case of INH, the majority of the toxicities are not related to concentration. Perhaps in slow acetylators, really, really high concentrations, not the ones we're discussing in this question, might be associated with either peripheral or central neuropathy. 
Excellent. Uh, looking at the uh, numbers of questions, they're uh, coming in quite a bunch, and that's uh, great. We have uh, plenty of time to answer uh, some more questions, so I'll keep getting those to be coming in off the QA. Um, the next one that we have coming in, Chuck, is uh, the question that came that says, is it the INH level or the rifamycin level that is more important for predicting rifamycin resistance? Well, in study 23A, it was both of them. And in study 22, which was uh, the once-weekly rifapentine 600 plus isoniazid 900 milligrams, in that situation, it was the isoniazid concentration that were predictive of failure or relapse with acquired rifamycin resistance. So in that situation, you could argue, as I showed, the rifapentine concentration stay above the MIC for quite a while, at least 48 hours. And if there's no isoniazid companion drug, because they malabsorbed it, then you're giving monotherapy in that study 22. So it was the low INH which stripped rifapentine of any protection for the selection of resistance. In study 23, it was both the INH and the excuse me, rifabutin that were associated with the selection of acquired rifamycin. Our next question um, has uh, goes a little bit beyond the scope of kind of what your, your talk was, Chuck, but I think it's very relevant and still touches uh, very important points related to your talk. But the question is, uh, what would be your recommendation if a drug susceptibility testing result shows susceptibility to INH, but uh, Haynes test, the uh, MT, uh, the DR plus test, uh, shows suggested INH uh, resistance. So you're looking at a discordant result between your uh, Traditional uh, therapeutic drug test, uh, not therapeutic drug testing, but the drug susceptibility versus the molecular. Well, first, whenever we get a sample from a patient, it may or may not be representative of everything that's going on inside that patient. So let's say we're talking about pulmonary tuberculosis, and we get a sputum sample, but that patient has more than one cavitary lesion. Well, where did those bugs come from, and are the bugs in both of those cavitary lesions the same? So. If a patient is infected with more than one strain or if they have selective drug resistance developing in one lesion versus another, you could easily get discordant results. The next thing is that uh, the susceptibility data or MIC data is a, a composite of all the different organisms that were in that isolate. So you may have a spectrum of very susceptible to very resistant organisms in that particular sample. and the Haynes test is going to say, well, for the bugs that we looked at, we found this mutation. Whereas the composite of mixing all of those bugs together to get an MIC or a, uh, a proportion method result is going to just look at the total population and not the presence or absence of a mutation per se. So you can see this, um, and it just represents the limitations of how we get our samples and how many organisms we get and how representative they are of the total body burden. And I, I think if I may add, check there as well, that any test, uh, the positive predictive value of any test is going to depend on the prevalence of that uh, within a given population. So the clinical information, epidemiologic risks, uh, would also be important to uh, address that, uh, that probability as well. Um, if we can, we understand that there are a couple of uh, questions that are coming in on the phone line. So if I can turn it over to the operator to uh, give us our first uh, telephone uh, question, please. Some of the stuff that we're talking about with pharmacokinetics may not be 100% true with the intermittency. 
And when we went back and looked at it again, almost all these patients either had extra pulmonary disease, which may in some ways describe what the CD4 association may have been, and or they have non-adherence early on. And I was just wondering, you know, for your comments, you know, you know, just to, you know, how you feel like that. We're somewhat, you know, while we obviously always look at PK data and, uh, and uh, therapeutic drug, you know, that it may not be, you know, how we interpret the data, I think there has to be some caution. And that it may not be as apparent as we think. And then secondly, uh, how you feel like one of the other things is that we have to remember that the PK data and the therapeutic drug monitoring is only one point in time. And you're only looking at what happened that day. And it's very possible intermittently, either because the patient was taking other drugs or didn't take it, that what we're seeing that one day may not reflect the whole course of therapy. Well, as far as the latter point, yeah, there's going to be some intrapatient variability. At least when we look at concentration over time, it tends to be reasonably consistent within a patient. So, uh, yes, there can be variability, in, and as I pointed up in the beginning of the talk, there are multiple reasons that patients can fail. So uh, not taking your drugs is the number one reason. Um, some pharmacokinetic variability or altering drug-drug interactions over time or herbal uh, versus drug interactions, all of those are possible. Uh, as far as the other point with extrapulmonary versus pulmonary disease, intermittent treatment or not intermittent treatment, uh, also again on those early slides, uh, what I was referring to but didn't use the actual term is pharmacokinetic siloing uh, when I was talking about lesions where the drug doesn't get to. So clearly, you know, that could be a factor. Uh, in all of those cases, what I would like to do is eliminate low drug concentrations as the reason. And happily, that's the one thing you can control. You can't readily control the size of the patient's lesion. You can't readily control how quickly their immune system is going to respond to heart therapy. But what you can do is make sure that you're not underdosing the drug. So that would be the short answer to that. And, and I totally agree with you, Chuck. I just kind of, I guess what I'd, I'd like to comment is that when we're making recommendations to go to less intermittent, it has a great impact on uh, public health and our resources. And I think that is an issue that needs to be looked at a little more closely before we, you know, you know, make a determined, you know, definite uh, recommendations on that. And again, thank you very much. Great talk. Thank you. Great. Um, are there uh, any other uh, operator? Are there any other calls coming in on the audio portion? There are no further questions at this time, sir. Okay. But, ladies and gentlemen, if you'd like to register a question, press one four on your telephone now, please. Thank you. We, we have a number of them still on the uh, Q&A portion, and I'll go ahead and move on to those. One of the uh, questions that came in from our uh, friends in Tennessee, a very good question, Chuck, that you and I were talking about just before uh, the presentation has to do with the dosing intervals of injectable such as aminoglycosides. Uh, the question is, it is not uncommon to transition from daily injectable dosing to thrice weekly. Is this practice likely to result in the development of acquired injectable resistance due to the AUC dropping below the MIC? The aminoglycosides, and by extension, we presume the case for the polypeptide capriomycin, have concentration-dependent killing. So big doses intermittently work well. If you look at the situation, say, with pseudomonas hypertinosa, we used to give gentamicin 80 milligrams every eight hours, now we give something like 400 milligrams once a day. And it is at least as effective, and at least in vitro, it's more effective. Uh, so extending the dosing interval for an organism that multiplies every 30 minutes uh, doesn't seem to be the problem because it's really not a time-dependent process. If you wait a month, that's probably too infrequent. Uh, but at least with two to months, you can go once a day. Then if we look at TB, it multiplies approximately every 20 hours instead of every 30 minutes. It doesn't seem unreasonable that you could extend the interval uh, of the injectable to every other day. As far as the toxicity, toxicities have relatively poor correlation with uh, the serum concentrations. And in particular, the vestibular toxicity and the hearing loss appear to be idiosyncratic reactions. You either are genetically disposed to have that or you're not. And it doesn't really matter if your peak was 30 or 80, you're either going to get it or you're not. Uh, so to take full advantage of the injectable's concentration-dependent killing, uh, 
and perhaps uh, to spare muscle if the patient is getting it intramuscularly. And for the older patient who may have somewhat diminished renal function, giving the drug plenty of time to get out of the body, my personal bias would be to use what used to be in the old guidelines, uh, the 25 megs per keg three times a week regimen, which essentially is the same as giving 15 milligrams per kilogram five times a week, but still 75 megs per keg to begin with either way. So my personal bias would be to give it three times a week for convenience as well as for pharmacodynamic reasons. But that could still be done in the context of giving the other oral drugs orally. Great. And uh, as you all know, we obviously uh, target the southeast uh, and the needs in the southeast, but uh, this is truly a uh, national and uh, this next question will reflect a global uh, webinar that has a far, range, a far reach. I have a question that comes in uh, from the Philippines, and here it's very relevant. The question is, is uh, we still have few cases of pulmonary TB patients that are co-infected with HIV, but we do have non-responsive patients with uncontrolled diabetes. How are the anti-TB medicines affected by blood sugar levels, and could that possibly be a, an accounting for their low response? Before I address that question, if I could just go back to the previous question for just a moment, and I think I misspoke. Uh, I was suggesting giving three times a week aminoglycosides on top of daily oral drugs, and I think I said orally twice instead of oral daily. So again, uh, I think you could give the injectable drugs three times a week at the higher dose, or at least the maximum dose you could give intramuscularly, which might be 1,500 milligrams, uh, but give the other drugs daily. It seems that it could be reasonable. Now, as to the question about diabetes and, uh, and tuberculosis and the response to therapy, uh, as you know, diabetics can have gastroparesis and other problems absorbing. Uh, so that's not shocking that those patients could have problems handling these drugs. At the uh, TB Pharmacology Conference that was just held right before ICAC in San Francisco about a month ago, uh, Rob Arnott and his group presented data where it appears that in the intensive portion of the treatment phase, you cannot really distinguish uh, between the response in diabetics and non-diabetics. But in the continuation phase where we're giving drugs, especially uh, only two drugs rather than four, and potentially giving those drugs intermittently, it was under those conditions that you could actually distinguish uh, between the absorption of the drugs uh, that uh, – were given to diabetics versus those to non-diabetics. So there does seem to be something going on. It's not exactly clear how extensive and how prevalent the problem is and whether it's more relevant in the continuation phase, but the current data suggests that these are the kind of patients you want to watch out for. These are also the kind of patients where you suspect maybe they're not absorbing the drugs and it might be reasonable to check the concentrations to confirm that that's, you know, that's not the case. As a, uh, as a clinical and programmatic person, I uh, really can appreciate a lot of the uh, very practical questions because those are many of the same questions that I have as well as far as managing some of these. Uh, one of uh, these very practical questions that comes up, and I'm sure that many of the clinicians and programmatic people out there have dealt with, is uh, this question. It uh, says, based on MIC values for the standard four-drug regimen in regards to patients who vomit, Will the dose count or the DOT count as being valid if the emesis occurs four hours after drug ingestion? So basically, can you get enough drug in before they vomit it? Well, if the patient has a normal GI tract, then for most of the drugs we're talking about, certainly for INH and rifampin and pyrazinamide, they're usually in by two hours. And you've already absorb most of the drug by two hours. There is some ongoing absorption after that, but the bulk of it has already reached into the bloodstream. Uh, for drugs like Ethambitol and Rifabutin, Ethambitol C-Max, or rather Time of C-Max, T-Max, is about two and a half hours after the dose, and with Rifabutin, it could be three or even four hours after the dose. So it a bit depends on which drug you're giving. But for the typical first-line drugs, if they got their DOT and then they vomited four hours later, it's probably not going to be a problem. If the patient has known gastroparesis and really slow emptying times, well, that's a different story, but that's not going to be the majority of your patients. 
Again, another question uh, from a practical one, which is a summary question, as we've had several uh, similar to this, um, has to do with uh, HIV co-infection. Uh, here in Florida, we have a fairly low threshold at times to get drug levels if we're ever uh, questioning a response or questioning some drug interaction. Uh, but I know that's not the case and that's not standard everywhere. Uh, what is your opinion in relation to these uh, group of questions that we had is that how do you know when you should be getting drug levels on patients that are HIV infected? And another question similar to it, or several others, had to do should drug levels be done on all patients uh, who are HIV infected? Well, there's no prospective randomized study to tell us one way or the other, so that's the, the fair answer. Uh, we do know that in otherwise healthy young adults with tuberculosis, the majority of them that were studied in, in clinical trials, they do well. So you could argue, well, just give the standard doses and hope for the best, and then just look for a delayed response. So if you have an otherwise healthy patient and they're still symptomatic after two or three weeks and they're still a smear, four plus smear positive after a month, well, that would tend to suggest that nothing is getting better and you might want to look at the concentration. Then when you add additional complicating factors, you add diabetes, you add hypertension, you add HIV, you add heart disease, well, then you can say that the patient's reserve is already being consumed by these concurrent illnesses, and you probably want to get things right up front. We do know that at least in cases of MDRTB and XDRTB, there's a high mortality rate in HIV-positive patients who have TB. So at least in those countries where this has been a big problem, uh, we have some data to say, well, these are the kind of patients you really want to pay attention to. There is no agreement as to who should get therapeutic drug monitoring and who should not. Now, you could say that maybe I'm just really a you know, retentive person and I don't like guessing at the dose. I want to know I'm giving the right dose, so I advocate getting the concentration. It's just because, you know, you're going to be giving this drug for six months. Wouldn't it be nice to give the right dose? Also, with the HIV drugs, uh, it's very common in Europe to do therapeutic drug monitoring for the HIV drugs. It's very uncommon, relatively speaking, in the United States to do so. But if you're giving a drug that's costing $9,000 to $12,000 a year for just one drug, wouldn't it be nice to know that you're giving that drug in perpetuity at the right dose? And you can do that with a simple single drug concentration at the trough. So my personal bias is the sicker the patient, the more complications they have, the more likely that if you get it wrong, you're going to suffer a clinical outcome that is poor. And those are the patients that I would be biased towards doing the therapeutic drug monitoring. But I think if you ask 10 people, you would get at least two, if not more, different answers to that. Thank you. Now, uh, moving, uh, our next question moves a little bit away from the standard four drug regimen and it looks a little bit more at the second line therapy, presumably for MDR. And uh, this question has to do with uh, cycloserine. Uh, the question is, if you achieve good serum levels with cycloserine at 500 milligrams once a day, does the pharmacokinetics uh, dictate that you should then be giving cycloserine uh, 500 milligrams every 12 hours? Well, for all the second-line drugs, and this is as good an example as any, uh, if you look at the fact that they're relatively weak drugs, then you could argue for multiple daily doses. Now, we have to make an extrapolation here because we don't really have good pharmacodynamic data for cyclosterine, but we do know that it acts upstream from what penicillins do as far as the peptidyl glycan synthesis. So one might posit that cyclosterine is more likely to be a time-dependent drug than not. And if that's the case, the more time that you have above the MIC, the better the drug should work. So all of that would argue towards giving the drug twice daily. As far as whether you have to or not, that can only really be answered in a prospective clinical trial, and there's very, very few data about the clinical use of cycloserine in the literature. So we're, we're kind of left guessing. Some centers, especially if you have an inpatient, give a cycloserine daily, uh, excuse me, twice daily, whereas on an outpatient basis, if you're trying to do DOT, it does get a lot more difficult to do twice daily DOT. So I can't tell you I have the right answer. My bias would be, if at all possible, to give the, the, the weak second-line drugs at least twice a day. And uh, one more question here that we've got that uh, came in on Q&A. Uh, there 
if someone writes in with a question about an HIV-negative patient that has cavitary uh, pulmonary disease that is an INH and risibutin because of rifampin intolerance, uh, the patient is currently getting INH 900 and rifibutin 300 biweekly, presumably DOT. Uh, the question is, is that is this inadequate? Some of the data that you presented seems that it would not be sufficient. And uh, I, for one, I'm also very interested in your uh, viewpoint on, on this. Even in the HIV-positive patients in study 23, 95% of them were effectively treated. So that bodes well. Um, and you could argue that in this patient, they at least are not HIV negative, so they have some level of immune system, though the fact that they went on to have cavitary uh, pulmonary TB suggests that it's not particularly useful against tuberculosis in particular. Um, the data I presented shows what's happening pharmacokinetically in the plasma. Are the tissue concentrations a little bit different than that? Perhaps. Um, is there what people would call a post-antibiotic effect? Perhaps, though those are things that are not well studied for TB in particular. My personal bias would be away from twice weekly regimen. And if you look at the NICE review by Wing Wei Yu and colleagues a couple of years ago, with each decrement in frequency of dosing, you lose a little bit of activity. So if you go from daily to uh, three times a week, three times a week is a little less active overall. And if you go further to twice a week, it's a little less active still. Um, as far as what to do in your particular patient, if they're doing well, if they're culture negative and smear negative, then you're probably doing the right thing. Um, it would be great to have more data uh, to, to make a definitive answer on. So you're going to essentially have to follow them clinically like you would any other way. If the patient were HIV positive, I would be nervous about twice weekly regimens, and I think currently the CDC recommends against highly intermittent either once or twice weekly regimens for HIV positive patients. The data that I showed today brings into questions for HIV positive patients whether an every other day regimen is also adequate, uh, at least in the context of a rifibutin regimen with lopinavir, ritonavir. So the answer really is we need more data. Chances are your patient's going to do well. I wish I could guarantee it, but I can't. Okay, and I know that uh, we've gone over time, and I want to thank uh, all of you that are still on, on board. We have one last question that we'll go ahead and answer. Um, this uh, last question, uh, again, has to do with uh, impaired renal function and uh, drug absorption. Uh, the question is, is that the caller wants to know uh, about kidney failure and drug absorption for those uh, meds that are uh, metabolized by the kidney. Uh, the example that the uh, questioner provides is, we have an MDR patient who, is, who still has active pulmonary disease and I presume is slow to respond with uh, evidence of dissemination to both the spine and the kidney. Uh, the drug doses are low, uh, although we don't have the exact ones provided, but it says the doses are low because the treating physician has uh, the idea that uh, because kidney function is impaired, uh, the blood levels will uh, be higher. Um, Chuck, if you can touch a little bit on, I guess, in general about uh, impaired renal function and what that might do. And also, I think uh, this kind of is a good uh, promo that I think if this is an ideal situation, I think, to do therapeutic drug monitoring. You have a high-risk situation uh, with NDR, and you have someone who has impaired renal function. So I'll pass it on to you, Chuck. Thanks. Well, obviously, these are complicated patients. If they've got MDR, TB, and disseminated disease, something bad is happening, and their immune system is not doing the job. And if they're on MDR, if they have MDR, TB, they're not getting INH or rifampin, the two really potent drugs. So we're looking potentially at a damatol, which is renally cleared, and you probably need to give that only three times a week if the patient has renal dysfunction. Now, from at least what I'm looking, uh, let's see, yeah, impaired renal function. Well, impaired is covers a lot of ground. If they're on hemodialysis, then the famitol is not going to be cleared through the kidneys. Part of it is cleared by the liver, and that might pick up some of the slack. The metabolites uh, of the famitol, it's not known if they're toxic or not. So the bottom line for famitol, if a person has you know, poor renal function, say creatinine clearance less than 30, or dialysis, I would probably give that drug no more than three times a week. But I would give it at the full dose, because as we saw, that the concentrations that a full dose produces are barely at the MIC. If you cut those in half, then you're just going to be giving sub-MIC concentrations of the damage 
Likewise, pyrazinamide, similar story. Uh, it's usually very well absorbed, uh, but it has metabolites of unknown toxicity, so I would suggest that uh, you, you give that drug three times a week. Cycloserine is definitely cleared by the kidneys. You might end up giving only 250 milligrams once a day. Pethionamide is cleared by the liver, so it doesn't matter what the kidneys are doing. You can give the usual doses, probably 250 to 500 twice a day for that. Um, and those are most of the drugs that you might consider. The injectables clearly are not going to be able to get out uh, if the patient's on dialysis. They, so those are drugs you probably have to give no more than three times a week. Uh, and for all of those drugs, in a patient such as described here, I would do therapeutic drug monitoring because why guess when you can know? I think also in follow up to that last question as well, I think it's a, a great segue here to mention also that uh, all of the uh, TB centers uh, or all the TB programs in the United States have full access to the uh, regional uh, TB training and medical consultation centers. So for complicated cases uh, such as this, please feel free to uh, give your, uh, I say local center, but your regional center a call and uh, discuss the case. Uh, these centers will not only provide medical consultation, as uh, most of you know, will also uh, provide uh, access to uh, other expertise and access to uh, advanced diagnostic testing if, if necessary. So please feel free to uh, contact your regional centers. Um, I'm going to go ahead and uh, close now. Uh, and uh, one again, I want to finish up by thanking everyone for their attention and their great questions. Uh, we had a, a near record number of uh, participants on this webinar and uh, with good reason. We really uh, appreciate uh, Chuck uh, making the time uh, to put together such a great presentation. Uh, for those of you who are interested in part two of why do TB drugs fail, on uh, November 4th uh, with uh, Dr. Cherry Jean Stambaugh, uh, we'll be doing uh, the second part of this uh, talk. Uh, please visit the uh, SNTC website uh, that you saw posted uh, earlier for more information. Uh, this uh, webinar will be uh, archived and available for uh, review later. And again, I want to thank you all very much for your attention and uh, your participation. And certainly feel free to contact us with any other uh, medical consultation questions, uh, training questions, or even questions related to this webinar. Thank you all very much, and have a great rest of the day.